adverse effects. So it involves both an objective experience as well as a subjective experience for the uh, concerned individual. And it also uh, in includes observing or experiencing a life-threatening event yourself uh, and also being violated by people on whom you depend for your well-being. And experiences become traumatic when they overwhelm our ability to cope with them. So when our coping resources are taxed, when we cannot process the event, it leads to trauma. And traumatic experiences can come in many forms, um, ranging from one-time events to experiences that are chronic or even generational. And while there are several categorizations of trauma, I thought I will look at two distinct but not mutually exclusive categories of trauma. Uh, the first type is a single incident or what we call acute trauma. And then uh, type two uh, or complex or developmental trauma. And it's this type two that I want to focus more on uh, in uh, my talk because um, that is what is relevant to uh, when it comes to children and people with disabilities. So when you look at the impact of trauma, it leads to a lot of psychological and physical consequences for individuals. If it's not uh, dealt with, if it's not processed, and if it continues, uh, it can lead to many intrusive memories, startle responses, um, nightmares and flashbacks. And it can also lead to a lot of uh, psychological consequences like feelings of hopelessness, shame, self-hatred, uh, and physical problems like insomnia and numbing and lead to loss of interest, irritability, depression, dissociation, hypervigilance, uh, memory problems, self-destructive behaviors, substance abuse, eating disorders, uh, chronic pain, headaches, and being you know like overwhelmed by emotions, not being able to regulate emotions and panic attacks and decrease concentration. So it leads you know, if the trauma is not managed, if, it, if it's uh, not processed and dealt with, it can lead to a wide variety of physical and psychological consequences. Uh, so I wanted to focus on that type two trauma that I introduced, uh, which is developmental trauma or complex trauma. This is a type of stressful event which occurs repeatedly and cumulatively. You know, the experiences, the stressful events add up usually over a period of time. And also it occurs within specific relationships and contexts. So this developmental trauma or complex trauma describes both children's exposure to multiple traumatic events across their, you know, um, childhood and adolescence. And often this trauma is of an invasive interpersonal nature and it has wide-ranging long-term effects. Um, this exposure leads to wide-ranging long-term consequences for the uh, person exposed to it and therefore these events are severe and pervasive. So multiple events that continue um, and leads to severe and pervasive effects. So what type of um, events or what type of experiences during childhood lead, can lead to this kind of complex trauma. Uh, obviously abuse in any form, physical abuse, emotional abuse, physical neglect, emotional neglect, sexual abuse, and also uh, the conditions in the family. Uh, if they have a household member, especially a primary caregiver, who suffers from mental health issues or a household member who is addicted to illegal drugs or alcohol or having you know, a household member who is in, in, incarcerated, uh, witnessing domestic violence and loss of a parent due to death, divorce or abandonment. So these kind of adverse childhood experiences uh, can lead to uh, complex trauma, especially if it continues and if it's not dealt with, if a lot of them happen to the child, uh, it can lead to complex trauma. Uh, and it can also affect the developing brain, okay? because trauma is a neurodevelopmental insult and it impacts the development of the brain as well as the psychological processes. 
Uh, so if you look at how the brain develops, it develops from the more primitive parts to the more um, complex part. And therefore, traumatic exposure disrupts the development of the uh, neocortex, particularly self-regulatory processes leading to chronic affect dysregulation, disruptive behavior towards self and others, learning disabilities, dissociative problems, somatization, and dist distortions in concepts about self and the other. So the brain responds differently after trauma because it affects, you know, uh, trauma while the, uh, experiencing trauma while the brain is developing uh, significantly affects what we call executive functioning. So there is less executive functioning and more flight or flight. And we'll explain what this means. Now, if you look at the, you know, the main areas of the brain, uh, in typical development, gradually, you know, the greater development is in the, uh, it, 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 it takes a bottom-up approach. And then um, the neocortex is responsible for a lot of this executive functioning. So that develops. But when there is trauma, it, the parts of the brain that are activated and that takes precedence are the more primitive parts that are responsible for survival. So the child is in a constant state of stress. Uh, the fight or flight uh, response is activated. So it can have lasting impact on the brain. So the impact of childhood trauma, uh, the impact of childhood trauma uh, can be seen in so many different areas. Uh, it can have impact on the mental health of the person uh, leading to uh, psychological, con psychiatric disorders like depression, anxiety, and also negative self-image, low self-esteem and post-traumatic stress disorder and suicidal ideation. It affects the brain development, as I mentioned, reduced brain development, less efficient processing, impaired stress response, uh, changes, it even affects changes in gene expression, and it can have an impact on physical health. Uh, so that can lead to sleeping disorders, eating disorders, poor immune system functioning, cardiovascular disease, shorter lifespan, and it affects your emotional health, difficulty controlling your emotions, trouble recognizing emotions, limited coping skills, increased sensitivity to stress, shame and guilt, excessive worry and hopelessness, feelings of helplessness, lack of self-efficacy. And also it leads to behavioral issues like poor self-regulation, social withdrawal, aggression, poor impulse control, risk-taking behavior, and it affects the cognition as well, uh, mental processes. So impaired readiness to learn, difficulty problem solving, language delays, problem with concentration, poor academic achievement, and it affects um, the social life as well, informing relationships. So leads to attachment problems, disorders, and poor understanding of social interactions, difficulty forming relationships with peers and problems in romantic relationships. And it can also lead to intergenerational cycles of uh, abuse. And developmental trauma can manifest as sensory processing disorder or ADHD, um, attention deficit hyperactive disorder, oppositional defined or disorder, uh, bipolar, or other personality disorders and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It can lead to cognitive impairment, speech delay, learning disabilities. So trauma during childhood can lead to a plethora of uh, psych psychological as well as uh, physical problems. And as I mentioned, you know, it, it leads to generational trauma. Uh, it leads to a life cycle of trauma because there's early childhood uh, trauma, which leads to emotional and cognitive behavioral problems as a child which leads to adolescent behavioral and mental health problems, and then leads to uh, not just um, psychological problems, but social problems like poverty and dysfunction. Uh, and, you know, in turn, these uh, people who are affected become impaired caregivers themselves. And that leads to early childhood uh, trauma again in another generation. So the impact could be generational. So moving on from talking about trauma, specifically to talking about trauma in disability. Now, there is decades worth of research showing uh, that people with developmental intellectual disabilities are significantly more likely to experience uh, these kind of adverse life events that lead to trauma. 
Okay, so it leads to uh, adverse life events, abuse and trauma in childhood compared to uh, others in the general population. And also uh, adults with a developmental or intellectual disability are more vulnerable to traumatic experiences and abuse than the general population. So there's a higher risk of uh, psychological trauma and develop developmental trauma among people with uh, intellectual disabilities. So there is a prevalence of co-existing experiences of trauma and disability. Uh, so just to uh, summarize some key research findings, some data, people with intellectual de uh, disabilities are seven times more likely to be sexually abused than those without disabilities. People with disabilities are two times more likely to be victims of violent crime and 40% more likely to uh, have the perpetrators of that abuse be someone they know, to be abused by someone they know. And over 70% of people with disabilities report being victims of abuse. 90% uh, of them said, you know, that it's not just a one-time event, it happens on multiple occasions. But surprisingly, only 37% reported the abuse to the authorities. This is uh, findings from the US. And, uh, you know, there uh, sometimes, uh, the acquired disabilities often result from acute traumatic events such as brain injury from a car accident. So there's that link as well. And survivors of childhood trauma have higher rates of learning disability. Uh, people living with congenital disabilities have been shown to often experience trauma from repeated medical procedures or extended isolation from loved ones due to frequent hospitalization. So uh, there is a high prevalence of uh, trauma and disability. And as I mentioned, children and adults with an intellectual disability are generally found to be more vulnerable to traumatic experiences and negative outcomes due to a variety of reasons. Uh, one of these reasons is that uh, often they are dependent on others for care and uh, they're uh, you know, dependent for longer. And they have limited emotional regulation and uh, cognitive, and they also face cognitive challenges which impact on their ability to identify risks, you know, of danger, possible danger, possible abuse. And they also have a limited ability to tell others. And they might find it more difficult to recover from a traumatic event due to limitations in their ability to describe the experience, uh, locate and describe the associated emotions. So uh, because of these reasons, uh, they are more vulnerable. And also the reality of disability itself can be traumatizing when you look at the stigma, um, you know, due to the immense stigma faced by people with disabilities uh, in society in general and marginalization by our society at large. So if you look at the trauma risk factors among people with disabilities, we can identify them at biological, psychological, and social levels. At the biological um, level, uh, there is impaired mobility in some uh, people with disabilities that leads to them being more vulnerable. And also their medical treatment and health care needs. And uh, when it comes to psychological factors, risk factors, they have been, as I mentioned before, also they have impaired ability to communicate in, uh, not all, but some of them. And there are also cognitive and processing um, delays. And... Uh, in, when it comes to social risk factors, uh, these children are dependent on caregivers for longer, children with disabilities, and they often have multiple caregivers. And you know, uh, this is especially true when it comes to um, South Asian countries, uh, people are, children are trained to be compliant, to be obedient, to listen to their adults, and uh, often not provided with general sex education, though, so they are very vulnerable when it comes to sexual abuse and they have no access to report any abuses or maltreatment, and their stigmatization and marginalization, which can lead to feelings of loneliness and isolation, which in turn makes them vulnerable to manipulation and exploitation. So, and uh, women in, with the disability are especially vulnerable to trauma. They are most vulnerable to intimate partner violence, which includes physical, sexual, psychological, and economic abuse. And they are more likely to experience intimate partner violence than men and women without disabilities, as well as men with disabilities. They are also more often subject to severe forms of physical abuse, include, 
been being kicked, punched, or bitten, and they remain in abusive relationships for longer periods of time than women without disabilities. And also they experience subtle forms of abuse, uh, ex, you know, like the more exploitative, ex, or exploitative aspects of disability, such as withholding medication or denying, being denied needed support. And women with intellectual disability or developmental disability are 12 times more likely to be sexually assaulted than women without disabilities. And what, I mean, so people with disabilities are more vulnerable and what is the impact? Uh, do they express the trauma in the same way as uh, the general population? So studies report differences in how PTSD symptoms are expressed. More behavioral expressions, heightened arousal and deterioration of adaptive skills can be seen by symptoms for re-experiencing flashbacks and avoidance are more difficult to recognize, especially in adults with uh, intellectual disabilities. And adverse life event and traumatic experiences among people with Intellectual disabilities are associated with mental health presentations such as psychosis and personality disorders and aggressive behaviors. And you can also see higher rates of stress-related difficulties, PTSD symptoms, depressive symptoms, self-injury, and OCD. But despite this impact, adults with intellectual disabilities are less likely to be offered interventions for trauma. The trauma is not recognized because it's manifesting in so many different ways, and they are not even considered for uh, generally not even considered for developmental trauma interventions. And it's an interactive impact. Not only are people with uh, intellectual developmental disabilities more likely to be exposed to trauma, but the exposure to trauma makes developmental delays more likely. They are, you know, people with disabilities are more vulnerable at every point in their life cycle, from birth to uh, death. Because of cognitive, social, and verbal skills, they are more vulnerable. To being exposed to abuse. So these experiences of trauma in developmental life stages inhibit the fundamental neurological development, leading to uh, even further disabilities. So the ability to adaptively integrate sensory, emotional, and cognitive information and make sense of the world is impaired. So there is an intersection. And also the other point is that the response to disability, uh, as well as the responses to trauma, can mediate this relationship between trauma and disability. So to end my talk, let me summarize uh, some of the points that I try to highlight in my talk. Uh, sometimes trauma can lead to disability. Uh, many people with disability experience trauma and trauma is more common for people with disability than those without any disabilities. And many people with disabilities who disclose their trauma are not understood or believed. And people with disabilities face additional barriers when reporting abuse and trauma. And sometimes people with disabilities are re-traumatized by society and, and how the others respond to their trauma. So there is a very complex interaction between disability trauma and the other aspects of a person's identity, such as their gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, etc. So I will in my talk, thank you. Uh, and I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to take questions now or at the end of all the talks in the symposium. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gurumunda. Very interesting and very informative session and very informative presentation. Um, uh, we uh, we ask uh, people to uh, quish, ask question. Uh, you can use chat box here or else uh, at the end of the session, uh, our speakers uh, will uh, answer your question. Uh, I, will, I would like to invite uh, my co-chair, Prasanna Kurupu, to introduce our second speaker. Mr. Prasanna, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Samita. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Priyanta Piritz. He's a, a trainer and a mentor on disability, and uh, he is a person with disability himself. Uh, he is the uh, Secretary of Sri Lanka Foundation for the Rehabilitation of the Disabled and also found the President of the Spinal Injuries Association. Uh, he is also the Vice President of National Paralympic Committee uh, in Sri Lanka. He has uh, more than 24 years experience in disability sector doing uh, peer group training, uh, peer group development and also disability consultant and so many other work. So I like to invite uh, Mr. Priyanta Piris to uh, take the floor and uh, explain the, the audience on the sports and recreation activities uh, for the disabled. 
Uh, over to you, uh, uh, over to you, uh, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Prasanna. I hope uh, you can hear me. Yes, go ahead. Okay, because uh, just as usual, uh, uh, adjust the uh, the camera a little bit. Uh, you are a little bit uh, out of focus. Okay, because I had to uh, switch on to uh, the phone uh, because as usual we have uh, power failure down here where I am based. So I had to uh, switch to the phone from the computer. So I'm not sure I, uh, I would be able to uh, use the PowerPoint, but anyway, I can explain uh, the topic uh, as a non-medical person uh, in a practical way that we observe and uh, intervene in sports and recreational activities for persons with disabilities. Firstly, uh, at the outset of my presentation, uh, let me outline uh, why sports and recreational activities are important to persons with disabilities or the disabled. Uh, firstly, I would see this uh, as a pastime because as you know, uh, many people, most people in Sri Lanka with a disability, uh, they absolutely uh, or hardly do anything with themselves for obvious reasons. Uh, so over 70% of the disability population are in unemployed, unemployed in Sri Lanka. So uh, this is a good uh, start, I, I would say, but unfortunately, uh, most uh, people or people, persons with disabilities, they don't see sports uh, as a pastime or at least to be occupied. Being occupied in some kind of sports or being engaged in some kind of uh, a recreational activity uh, itself uh, would uh, bring them uh, satisfaction. Uh, but uh, we don't see that happening in the uh, country uh, for obvious reasons, which I can explain to you uh, in a short while. So and the other uh, most important thing is that uh, being engaged in sports uh, would uh, build up your physical health and not only your physical health, but uh, also uh, you would be, uh, you will be psychologically and mentally very strong. So uh, with persons with disabilities, uh, sports, uh, can play a major role. And uh, the other mo uh, most important thing is to uh, build uh, networks within your community, within your groups, within your organization, with other organizations. Uh, so this is, this is uh, very important for persons with disabilities to get engaged in some kind of recreational activity or sports simply because uh, they could uh, find new friends, new contacts. So this may result in uh, various advantages such as finding employment and also maybe uh, winning prize money at uh, internationally recognized events. So which we see uh, happening uh, in the very uh, recent past. So these are the these are the areas that we see uh, why sports and recreational activities are important for persons with uh, disabilities. And uh, when we speak of uh, the present status or uh, the present uh, atmosphere with uh, persons with disabilities in getting engaged in sports. Uh, is uh, limited, though we see uh, certain activities uh, take place annually. For example, we have uh, the Friends in Need Society uh, to be uh, organizing uh, sporting events, especially for amputees, uh, in partnership with uh, the Rotary Clubs or the Rotary Clubs. Uh, and then also uh, the annual sports events organized by the Department of Social Services. Uh, and then we have uh, 
national championships from archery to swimming uh, organized by the national uh, paralympic committee where i come from so we have uh, events or sports disciplines uh, such as uh, badminton table tennis archery rowing uh, powerlifting air rifle wheelchair basketball and so on so these are the events that are being uh, conducted uh, or organized annually but not regularly and then we have individual uh, training uh, done by uh, various uh, coaches for individual athletes and then also as units as uh, clubs especially within the uh, sri lanka army in the army and the navy we have uh, about 15 uh, sports clubs for para athletes uh, and then we have uh, affiliated clubs uh, do their own uh, sports training and lastly we see uh, training programs or sports taking place in uh, vocational training institutions run by the department of social services and also uh, different institutions managed and run by uh, the ngos uh, which is included in their curriculum or the mandate so they have uh, different sports uh, programs but uh, it's not done or it's not uh, professionally carried out uh, unlike we see in other asian countries uh, so basically uh, we have uh, uh, certain criteria to be met Uh, for persons with disabilities to uh, get engaged in sporting activities uh, in a very uh, practical and a decent manner because uh, the reason is uh, we need uh, quite a number of sports trainers to support and help them which we don't see here in sri lanka and then uh, we have other issues such as uh, accessibility in the built environment so that is a must especially for persons with physical disabilities and uh, com- uh, communication accessibility access in communication for athletes or sports men and women with intellectual disabilities hearing in my impairment and so on and also uh, accessibility requirement in the transportation system and lastly uh, we need to empower we need to empower persons with disabilities to uh, uh, get involved in uh, some kind of sporting activity or a recreational activity because other than the field activities we see uh, or we are attached to we also have uh, games such as uh, chess is for the blind so it is uh, internationally uh, recognized so it has been now included in the paralympic movement as well so we have uh, indo games uh, such as chess etc for different kinds of uh, disabilities you know, when you when we speak of uh, persons with uh, visual impairments or the blind so it is a fundamental uh, need that a person who cannot see should get involved uh, in some kind of sporting activity simply because that person cannot see because uh, he or she does not know uh, what cricket is what athletics is what swimming is unless they have been trained practically so this is uh, very uh, important for persons with uh, visual, uh, visual impairments to get involved in sports and to know what sports uh, signifies with uh, each other sporting disability and empowering uh, the community is also very important because uh, in our society the community has a tendency until recent uh, until the recent past was that uh, a person with a dis- disability should uh, remain at home not to get, get involved in uh, uh, harmful activities such as sports 
so this is one one uh, uh, way of uh, attitude that uh, the parents or uh, the community have uh, towards persons with disabilities so uh, there are interventions that uh, we can uh, make towards uh, promoting uh, sports for persons with disabilities so we need to intervene in uh, different ways so that uh, more and more uh, persons with disabilities get involved in some kind of uh, sporting activity because as you know uh, the current uh, disability population in sri lanka is around uh, 9 to 10% of the population if not uh, close upon uh, 2 million people uh uh with some kind of a disability a major disability so but the sad story the sad part of it is uh, when it comes to sports uh, it's only a very handful of uh, persons with disabilities between the ages of 10 to 45 get involved in sports in numbers it's even less than 4000 4000 uh men and women against a population of 2 million persons with disabilities so you you could simply imagine the status of uh, this country compared to other countries where it, when it comes to uh, sports and recreational activities so because one reason i see is like uh, i uh, come from a, a disability and a rehabilitation background because uh, a uh, few years after my accident i underwent rehabilitation at uh, ragama the ragama rehabilitation hospital uh, where we not only underwent uh, medical rehabilitation but we also underwent occupational social uh, and uh, sporting rehabilitation during our rehabilitation process so i should uh, uh, i would uh, like to mention uh, during that time uh, we actively got involved in uh, sporting activities within the hospital while being a patient while still being a patient uh, during these times uh, 3 pm onwards we were we had a, a time schedule for sporting activities namely uh, mainly wheelchair basketball so which ended up by uh, having three three uh, patients at that time been selected to represent the national wheelchair basketball team during dr lalit vijayaratna's time so that was the time uh, that peer group training concept was introduced into the rehabilitation system so uh, or some or other reason uh, we did not see it uh, developing uh, Uh, within the rehabilitation setup and then also uh, within the newly opened uh, rehabilitation hospitals uh, we see in our days in uh, different provinces because uh, traditionally uh, in countries such as sri lanka and few other countries in asia uh, we have been concentrating only on the medical model that is to treat a person with a disability medically and then discharge him or her with a satisfactory note that uh, medically now you are ready to go home so we have completed your treatment medical treatment so until uh, uh, very recently uh, it this was uh, the this was uh, the concept that uh, many many in society thought that uh, if you become a disabled if you uh, meet up with an accident all you got to do is to uh, rehabilitate the person medically that's all so uh, this is why uh, i am not sure uh, uh, the present situation uh, in the rehabilitation setup these days Uh, but uh, this is why uh, the social model is not coming into place because if so then uh, like we see in uh, uh, bangladesh india 
So within the rehabilitation process, within the rehabilitation network, within the rehabilitation program, uh, sports is a must. They have practical uh, training immediately after the medical treatment. Like we have uh, vocational training here. In other countries, we see uh, medical sports training also in being included in the rehabilitation process. So I think this is very important to move out of the medical model and then think of the social model, economic model, diversity model, accessibility model, and uh, so on. So surviving, survival is uh, the foremost aspect of a person who becomes disabled. So like we discussed in the Maslow hierarchy, so after survival, there are many more steps, many more processes that we need to follow up the ladder. So uh, once the medical rehabilitation is completed, so each and every person in the country, whether uh, you get into a rehab hospital or not, uh, they should be encouraged by the social services officers uh, to get involved in the various activities. Because uh, traditionally, we still see that uh, the vocational training programs run by the Department of Social Services uh, is outdated almost for two, more than two decades. So only recently we uh, stressed the point with the Department of Social Services, why don't you include sports? So we have not uh, got involved or come into a partnership between the National Paralympic Committee and uh, the Department of Social Services to encourage each and every person who, is, who has the ability to do sports in each of the Gram Seva Niladari uh, through the AG, AG Office Social Service Officers to uh, empower them to get, get involved in sports. Uh, so because we have district sports officers as well, uh, in each district. Under them, we have uh, AG Division sports officers, but uh, their excuse is that uh, they are overwhelmed with work and then they don't have time for persons with disabilities uh, and uh, they don't see a reason uh, how they could uh, help or support persons with disabilities to be trained as athletes. So, but uh, with the recent international achievements we see in the para movement, para Olympic movement, uh, things are uh, slowly but steadily changing. So this is this is what I see as a person with a disability uh, who uh, did sports before my accident, also after my accident. Uh, that sports is very important, including recreational, recreational activities uh, for the well-being of a person with a disability. Because there are affiliated sports clubs in the para movement, Paralympic movement. So we have well over 60 sports clubs, but still again, we have uh, funding issues, infrastructure issues for most of these clubs to uh, train their athletes. Uh, purely considering uh, the accessibility issues, not only totally physical accessibility in the built environment uh, for wheelchair users, but for intellectual disabilities, for the blind, deaf, and other physical disabilities. So we have uh, issues to be addressed. So with this, I wind up my presentation and then I would uh, uh, leave time for any questions at the end of this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Priyanta, for that very informative uh, presentation uh, with uh, the technical difficulties. I think uh, you have touched upon uh, very, very important areas outside the box, especially the, the perspective of uh, uh, perceptions in the, uh, the rehabilitation and especially in sports. Um, I think, uh, as you mentioned, the sports can uh, play a key role in, uh, in especially in the peer-to-peer -peer support and also uh, for the children uh, to be the ice-breaking uh, for the uh, rehabilitation, probably 
um, you have covered a lot. And also uh, the other components like uh, outside the medical uh, approach uh, uh, in rehabilitation, there are so many other steps. Um, let me say that I like to uh, uh, ask Dr. Samita to uh, introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Prasanna. Uh, our last speaker, uh, Dr. Pushpa Ranasinghe, uh, Senior Consultant Psychiatrist at the uh, National Institute of uh, Mental Health. Uh, she will talk about uh, management of psychiatric concern in disability. Over to you, Madam. Thank you, Samita. Can you hear me? Yes, madam. Okay. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, these uh, psychiatric concerns and the management of uh, these uh, psychiatric uh, disabilities uh, in uh, rehabilitation. And uh, the first of all, and I would like to tell you uh, some facts. Okay. Uh, adults with disability report frequent with, uh, mental distress. I mean, they are five times more than the open adults uh, without disabilities. And these uh, adults with disabilities, they have increased risk of suicide and suicidal ideations. And uh, they also, as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, they have social uh, constraint. Then they have limited access to public transport places and lack of flexible work, work option where it will really uh, impact their economic income. And all these uh, constraints and limited uh, capacities and leads to a life-threatening depression, which will end up sometime in uh, committing a suicide, taking their life. And so let's see, like I'm going to just explain first what will happen if somebody uh, facing injury and with uh, what are the psychological consequences that they get. It's just like uh, the physical disability is similar to the mourning process, just after bereavement. In the, in the first state, they will become shocked. They don't Dr. believe Shpa, that they can have. I, yeah. uh, can I disturb you? Your yeah. screen is not visualized to us, so I don't know whether you're not sure. Okay, give me a minute, I'll do the same. Yeah. Can you see? Not yet? Not yet. Dr. Samita, can you see now? Hello? No, I don't know. It seems okay. like it's shared, but uh, cannot see it. Yeah. Okay, now it's there. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you very Let's much. Make it the slideshow. <laughs> yeah. 
yeah these are the steps that my mind means on for somebody uh, go through uh, a serious injury or a, a, a just after uh, any physical uh, just after a stroke or injury and they go through the four stages basically they become shocked and denial and they become angry or depressed and the last stage is they are adjusting to the acceptance and uh, living a normal life but the thing is or uh, uh, with just uh, in the way like come I mean, in a different way of thinking now their life is going to be different so the shock and what happens when anybody like come I mean, in they lose that and uh, they get shocked that they can't believe and they they had this and after with this shock they become a denial they don't believe that they have a uh, they uh, they have this disability or become they become very fearful and the denial stage they act as if they never they don't have any disability right and this is really like i mean they are in the shock state they are confused and uh, they are numb and the thing during this stage what happen is that during denial the mainly why we are worried about the denial is they don't undergo any processes that will improve their status they think they totally refuse no i don't have any injury or i don't have any disability i don't want to go through this and i'm fine i'm totally fine they never agree that they have a thing and then they come to a stage with anger so this shock and denial may last for uh, maybe uh, one or two days or it may last for two three months and then they become angry and they are frustrated they are anxious at time and with the anger will be mainly it's always shown to their closest people who are really helping them right they are maybe their loved ones their parents or their maybe their children or the carer and with that with that anger they they reject the carers as well so which will be very difficult for the treatment process and this uh, process, process of rehabilitation and then they go into a stage of a depression and they become detached they don't even want to talk to anybody and then they they are over and they become very hopeless and they feel they going to a helpless stage and uh, they won't be doing anything whenever the uh, therapist ask them to do something or they do some activities they never get engaged they are say no it's not going to work you know and uh, this is the way that i'm going to be for the rest of my life is better to die like then i mean just i see that i am going to get a slow death and during this depression that can in, end up with so many other things as well i'll describe later as well then they have got a, then the time sometimes they tend to bargain they are asking like reaching out to others and then some to uh, sometimes they might do so many things like i mean in sri lanka in the uh, setting of uh, our cultural setting they may go to uh, their respective gods or the different they might change their religion and though they try to get i mean to go, go to their non evidence based uh, treatment or just go search for anywhere try to get uh, their previous state back and after that they are acceptance and they are uh, with that they understand what's going on so what happened to them it might take a longer period usually in bereavement is 6 months but the thing is in this uh, sort of a disability or injury it might go on for a longer period maybe one or two years even and then slowly they come back to their normal state so what happened in this denial usually this last for about Three weeks to two months, and during this time, this is denied the defense mechanism, and this is interferes with the treatment and rehabilitation of course. And anger and depression, this is a reaction to loss, right? So then they change their social treatment and status, and how the pe- other people treat you in the beginning because you were a star, star in the past. Now you are not going to be a star anymore because you have lost your capacities in a way that your abilities, and they are not going to treat you well. and then uh, then the they have a problem with the body image and also then they have uh, with this anger that they are going to chase away everybody who comes closer closer to them and don't want to accept any help so it will it's a very difficult uh, period for the relatives and the loved ones when they are who's trying to help them and the last stage is accept, acceptance and the successful then they will successfully adapt to a new situation new uh, role and then they realize the other potential that they have and they know their limitation 
and they know they have what the other potential they have and maybe the other uh, talents they have they use those and uh, reach to the top and accepting their whatever the loss and reaching to the top so that is what expected when we are treating a person with a uh, disability and so the first stage is a depression so then they are unable to do daily work and experience frequent mental distress and they have depressed mood then they do they are not interested anymore the person who is interested in listening to music or dancing or talking to other people and then they have sleep is disturbed and they have low energy and fatigue and they have poor concentration and they have aches and pains and they complain of they are not going to um, comply with their what exercises or whatever things that they are asking to do and they have poor concentration and they become very mm, restless and they are think they are not stable right and so this goes on for so many weeks or months and they might at last end up uh, with attempts or completed suicide so we have to understand that that we have to recognize this stage b and if you pick it up early like when they are getting depressed and they are not interested in the previous thing and not putting everything into disability and we have to assess them in their state that's why uh, somebody a mental health professional should be closer and to be referred to a mental health professional or the person who's uh, giving other Uh, treatments because uh, the the rehabilitation process the exercise uh, therapy so they should have an understanding uh, about when the recognize with the person's going getting depressed whether we need whether he needs a further assessment and treatment which will enhance the process of uh, recovery and so management of this depression so usually that uh, we can give antidepressants or that seen uh, ssris or like is that is serotonin reuptake inhibitors this uh, we can give a fluoxetine uh, then the paroxetine or venlafaxine or any of those things and we give uh, tricyclic antidepressants and uh, actually within 6 weeks uh, of antidepressant therapy they will recover and they think we can combine with the cognitive behavior therapy with the uh, occup- with the help of a psychologist where we can we restructure their negative thought pattern and uh, ask them to uh, think uh, uh, differently and then it will be a process of about two or three months and this uh, continuing this cognitive behavior therapy is uh, more uh, it's effective as uh, giving for the mild depression effective as uh, um, antidepressants or the combination of these two cognitive behavior therapy as well as antidepressant therapy is really uh, very really successful stories being given the other one is the interpersonal therapy and because that uh, people always i told you that they show their anger towards their closer ones so do we have to uh, we have to discuss with this and to see that how to deal with this their anger and uh, the the way the behaviors and which they make them distance with others and their peers or the loved ones or the workplace then we have to they, we have to refer them to a interpersonal for interpersonal psychotherapy to a psychologist and who will be able to uh, handle with this and change their pattern of behavior and they are this work through this trouble relationship and with all this or if you have depression very severe you are not take eating and drinking and not uh, doing any uh, they are not interested in doing anything and severely suicidal ideation with then we may have to give electroconvulsive therapy where it's a very quickly they recover the depression and with the uh, 3 or maybe 6 uh, electroconvulsive therapy treatment and they will be with medication and with psychotherapy uh, if the, those does not work in the beginning we may have to uh, in, at the end we may have to give electroconvulsive therapy so that is one of the uh, treatment methods and with this we can uh, they can go back to their normal uh, level of functioning or in a way like i mean this is in a new, new role they will be functioning maximum and so some people will go to uh, anxiety and post traumatic disorder then i think the previously you heard that but they say that uh, they become very anxious and uh, they avoidance behavior they don't go to uh, the person who was uh, uh, maybe who had an accident they are in the uh, railway or they might not travel there don't look at any of those uh, uh, sort of accidents or anything on the tv 
or uh, maybe they they don't want to see visit those they just remain inside the room so maybe these people with anxiety you may be able to and the ptsd you may be able to treat them with with the help of a psychologist and uh, we can do a pro progressive um, relaxation or cognitive behavior therapy or with a group therapy is one of the best thing to do the group therapy people who are in the they can share their experiences and their thoughts and do activities together and then uh, engage in the recovery process and then the systematic desensitization and stress inoculation is another two things that uh, in occupational therapies uh, mainly involved and the psychologists are involved in these uh, therapies and as well as virtual reality with technologies like sometimes now we are technologically always improved that we don't maybe we don't need the therapies at home we can use this virtual reality technologies can be used where the people have a fear of balance a fear of walking or fear of standing and a fear of uh, height or any of these and we can use this virtual reality technology and train them to come go back to normal and then also the medication for this anxiety and post traumatic stress disorder and uh, then the substance abuse and alcoholism another problem with these people because uh, they may abuse substances with pain or they may get addicted or they take the prescribed medication like opiates in the beginning with given for pain right so maybe this addiction will link to depression because they are depressed and they don't they are always feel the negative thoughts they might just uh, want to take alcohol and all the substances forget about everything right so they get they because sometimes they are being isolated because maybe there is only one who's staying at home all others are going to work or in other way so they might develop because of this isolation and they are not able to access other places they may develop this uh, depression and the substance abuse uh, also the setting and then the stigmatization that they do this once you are not given the same recognition uh, like before and they are raising awareness with support, supporting inclusion that's what uh, i think previous speaker uh, stressed upon and supporting inclusion for them to be included in all other activities and linking men, linking to mental health or addiction services to get rid of this uh, substance and uh, substance use and alcohol abuse from a uh, program so like then they are ready to get a program and then we will able to get a better outcome of these people and uh, what is the barrier to mental health care maybe the maybe the infrastructure is not accessible maybe they are not available for people with disability to reach these mental health services uh, or that uh, they are not adequate people are not trained for uh, psychotherapy psych or then the cognitive behavior therapy or another behavior techniques or in the cognitive behavior therapy then uh, other uh, things in the virtual uh, therapies and they are not being trained right so uh, then they will no support from the caregiver to take them even if it exists to take them place the uh, place so they don't have the access to go and they don't have means to go and they, the caregiver has to help them if they are not supportive they won't be able to and it's very expensive right then stigmatization sometimes they don't want to go and see like i mean uh, sometimes the people say that i don't want to go to a hospital where i'm disabled i'm not that disabled so some they feel so stigmatized to go there and then lack of integrated care so like previous we said we only focus on the pain relief and physical comfort and there's no holistic approach at that so then uh, we just think about only these two topics then the employment unemployment then poor these people remain poor because uh, they have to depend on others and very expensive the maintenance cost uh, people even if you get other um wheelchairs or if you are incontinent and then you have to have you know how expensive the uh, incontinent pads are in sri lanka yeah so then they have communication barriers as well and they have phobic uh, social interaction and facial abnormality because the, people with facial abnormalities or other abnormalities maybe are, they are in the fear of rejection from others because of their appearance so even then which uh, which keep them away from the mental health care the available mental health care and other services and so this thing we have to bridge this gap between the physical and mental health care where we have to work together the psychiatrists the caregivers the physical health providers 
then advocacy groups, the client and the mental health authorities, families, social workers, nurses, and psychologists. So it's a group has to work together, focusing on the individual person-centered care, but we have a unique intervention for that person. And uh, that's the contrast of paradigm, how we treated the disabled person in the past and now. In the past, uh, it was like we want to fix the individual and correct the deficit. But now the new concepts are, the new trend is, we remove the barrier. Right? We don't have to fix the individual, we remove the barrier. We create access to the accommodation and universal design. Right? So that's why because we have all these disabled ability laws and all that we create an environment, right? So then you, know, you can't build a, build a new building without disabled access, right? So we make that they're inclusive and they are the, the new trend is we promote wellness and health. And uh, so uh, the other one is then the old is the provision of medical and vocational and psychological rehabilitation services. But I think still we are doing that, okay? But I think the new trend is the provision of support, like assistive technologies and personal assistance services and job support. And these people will be very well good in computer skills, maybe, though they are disabled, and we have to identify our talents, and with that, uh, we have to get them into the great place. And then providing benefits, okay, in Sri Lanka, they are providing benefits for disabled people. Uh, then uh, I think now the trend is then just providing benefits and we have to get, we have to make them more enabling and uh, promote the civil rights. And if, instead of providing benefits, we are making enabling people, then they are able to work like all other people. We, are, uh, we uh, provide um, services and facilities where they can reach their maximum potential. Yeah. And then the medical problem. It was considered a medical problem in the past. But now uh, we have to focus on the social environmental issues involving accessibility and then the accommodation and the inequity because uh, there is uh, so much of uh, unequal treatment about disabled people that we make everything and we design everything for a fully able people to reach. But we never think about disabled people to reach. So I think. We have to make the environment feasible for them, where they can reach uh, wherever they reach their dreams. And uh, I would like to close this. Even these people with a disability, you can get into another phase in the uh, thinking. Like, where once you are disabled, you have got, uh, like, you are disabled, disabilities. <laughs> Does not change the person. Instead, the disability presents the concept a person had about who they are. Because, because with your appearance and all that, you may say, my appearance is not me, right? It's my abilities and things, are my potential and the things that we have to promote and to find who you are, find oneself. Maybe it's a very great opportunity, really know who you are and what I can do for the society, how maximum I can give to the society and to be living with a well-being, improving the well-being of others as well as the well-being of uh, themselves. Thank you very much for your listening. And uh, I really uh, thank these organizers uh, for this, uh, organizing this uh, program, uh, the, um, the, this, uh, uh, our this uh, program and I think really it, even when I was reading about this and thinking about uh, relating it even my thinking pattern about disability has changed so we have to make them enable being and they are not little or different than us thank you very much have a great evening thank you very much madam uh, yes uh, find yourself uh, for, thank you very much for the interesting uh, and uh, very informative presentation. Uh, we have came to the end of the session. This is time for question. If you have any question, you can ask it directly or you can use the chat box. If I could post the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, no. Actually, my Actually, question my is question from uh, 
the second speaker with regard to sports and recreation the uh, for medical now uh, the one of the uh, opinion from the uh, presentation was that the medical professionals do care of the medical aspect but the rehabilitation the rest of the rehabilitation is not been that much looked into uh, actually uh, we had been far behind the rehabilitation process altogether with regard to healthcare and if there had been any improvement of rehabilitation that actually has been based on the processes that has been occurring in our forces i think because that forces started rehabilitating they are the uh, uh, the war victims there had been so much of an improvement in rehabilitation process altogether here in sri lanka we believe so medical profession is far behind in rehabilitation that's why uh, there is so much of interest enthusiasm and the coordination need to be done in rehabilitation uh, in in the rehabilitation component of the medical profession so based on that the uh, i mean this is understood among the medical profession and based on that the uh, there are, there are a lot of initiatives of uh, out of which one is Uh, that we have started uh, developing rehabilitation step, step specialists of our own mm -hmm. uh, the question is that uh, i just want to ask the other uh, other the say for an instance from samita would say that how her feeling with regard to the medical profession and rehabilitation Sorry, madam. Did you ask me? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it's the first one. Sorry, me. Priyant. Mm. The, the uh, I mean, yeah. The uh, so the uh, I mean the in general we are far behind in medical rehabilitation. We will understand it, and there is so much to improve. And we, I mean, just a few minutes before we two physicians were talking, and we felt that rehabilitation is part and parcel of all medical professionals, and. Uh, so i mean we are in the process of developing and uh, there are many changes that are happening uh, yeah. so uh, i mean say when you met with the accident uh, the way that you were taken care of by the medical profession i mean do you have the same feeling that the medical profession uh, do leave uh, patients i mean who need rehabilitation We, do we just uh, end up with medical care and do we look into the rehabilitation or i mean what uh, is your feeling with regard to the i mean this is based on uh, i mean this is mainly for development of the system okay yeah yeah uh, consider, considering institutional rehabilitation in sri lanka uh, there are some gaps but uh, but i am very uh, happy about the uh, institutional rehabilitation but the problem is when we send patient out uh, we don't have uh, any um, um way to follow them up because of that uh, most of the thing uh, we achieved in institutional rehabilitations are not uh, it, it is it's a waste sometimes i feel that it is wasting time because uh, when send, when we send the patient to the, their community they are coming with a lot of uh, complication Uh, i think uh, we have to think about the community based rehabilitation uh, development of community based rehabilitation community support uh, with the development of institutional rehabilitation so i think uh, with that we can get uh, much more achievement in rehabilitation thank you dr padma can thank i thank you uh, santa thank you very much yeah. and in fact uh, it indeed is the re i mean and one aspect that uh, we need to improve because the i mean say from the health that we pay more the prevention and cure whereas uh, from the social services there is so much to be done for community rehabilitation and they too have to liaise i mean more closely so that the patients uh, get sort of a comprehensive package uh, for their needs Uh, so i think the gaps are between the maybe the two ministries with regard to uh, 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 
providing the needs for our people. So there is so much for us to move forward. Thank you. Dr. Padma, can I add something yes. for this uh, discussion? Yes, definitely. It's yes. like I have experience uh, in uh, the, some interracial experience. Uh, one is uh, in, in Israel, the military has started uh, recreational centers in every division where it's open for the military and for the civilians as well. So these places are they're doing all the kind of rehabilitation, but name as recreation centers governed by the military and also with the civilian setup. Anyone in that area can uh, enter, even they can re have residential facilities for a couple of days and do things like that. But our system is not that um, uh, organized. On the other hand, uh, there is this uh, rehabilitation hospital uh. in Bangkok where they have a uh, 45 uh, day program. The moment the patient comes to the emergency medical uh, care, after 45 days, they are sending them back to home with five days independent living experience in the same hospital. It is in Bangkok. I think uh, some doctors have visited with me in 2009. And on the other hand, uh, there is this uh, victim assistance, uh, uh, some discussion with the uh, mind band treaty where the landmine victims, uh, they have come up with a tool called the victim assistant uh, the process where they have the first pillar, the, about seven pillars. First pillar is the emergency medical care. Then the component is the continuous medical care, a place like rehabilitation hospital, Ragam. There, then they have this psychological uh, involvement then also uh, inclusion and integration to the uh, society like that. There are seven pillars of this process. So in our country, uh, the, the military has started this uh, with the experience, but ad hocly addressed without any uh, proper process. But I think those are the kind of gaps we have. So uh, there are two uh, books I can share with you all. One is about explaining this victim assistance process. Other one is to just to check where we stand in the, in the checklist. So anyone can just go through these questions and see where we stand. So I think I can share with you all to have a, a, a this assessment about what's the reality of uh, the rehabilitation services in Sri Lanka. And uh, with my personal experience, I also have gone through a mortar bomb attack in, in 1990. With that experience, I can say in 1990, though it is not uh, procedurally correct, there were some kind of interventions. Uh, there were referrals. Uh, until I reached home, I was referred uh, by the civilian um, general hospital as well as the, the, uh, the military setup. So that's my experience. In uh, the, the, There are gaps, but uh, things are happening sometimes in isolation. Uh, the, actually, for military, I think that when compared with the economic status of the country, I think we are far ahead. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, you, the military is very much uh, privileged. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you consider the ordinary citizens, I don't think uh, that, uh, I mean, what they get is uh, sort of uh, to a point that uh, we could be happy with. So that's the place that I think that military health can be as uh, Minister of Social Services, we have to get together and to uh, decide of a, a framework that would suit all the, all in the community. And I had to uh, that Dr. Padma. Thank you. And uh, this is about like, I mean, I, my experience when I uh, visit, visited this uh, Hyderabad uh, for the disability uh, program. And the Hyderabad and the village, a community based rehabilitation program, where the physically disabled and the mentally disabled, they have the disability is as a one group, and they do the community education awareness raising together. So, working together in the community, these two groups, mental disability and the physical disability, and they are supporting each other. And it's, they have uh, done a very uh, big uh, process of like improvement in the society and change in the um, they are people's uh, uh, how they perceive the disability as well as that um, the strengthening their uh, changing their belief system as well as saying that it's not that we are physically disabled they are not cognitively impaired right so in that way that they have the because of their the other abilities they have shown and they are working together and really successful. I think we can do that because mental health also has so many. Now we are um, you know, focusing on community-based rehabilitation 
as well as community based services we uh, always extended our service in the community yes. so we can work together i think uh, it, it's just a suggestion i think we can improve more and uh, come in the base level that we can do more for the society Uh, hi, um, Dr. Gunaratna. My name is Primal Fernando. Um, I actually am based in Melbourne. I just joined the call uh, because I saw a link from Dr. Samita. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick example. Um, I was in Colombo recently and I started working with some young people. And uh, my focus has been to help them to get employment at an executive level. Um, and I've managed to get three jobs for three people who are long-term unemployed, you know. And uh, so, and I'm still working with two other people. Um, I think the w this discussion is really good. I think the focus needs to be empowering people to get mainstream jobs. Uh, what I find is um, uh, that, uh, you know, they try to give you, get jobs for people with disabilities, but... Uh, they don't want to encourage people to go at the management level or at the executive level. So uh, in my small way, uh, I'm trying to change that. Uh, I, I, um, to, just to give you a bit of background, uh, I was born with cerebral palsy and had an accident when I was nine. I was fortunate enough to go since when I was 18, uh, but um, I've now uh, come, uh, come back to Colombo uh, uh, often as I can, but this year, I've done some work with uh, Professor Saman Mali and the IIT Center. So I think uh, when you're doing rehabilitation, you need to focus on uh, helping them to get meaningful employment. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vimal. Vimal, uh, thank you very much for your uh, positive comments. Uh, I think that, in fact, I mean, you may be more familiar that say, as per our constitution per se, or I mean, say, uh, legally, uh, the government is bound to provide 3% of the employment, government employment for disabled people. Uh, but as you say that for higher positions, I just do not know they definitely must be with limitations. Yes, thank you for your comments. Um, I have a question. Uh from asking from uh, Priyanta Perez. Priyanta, uh, could you please explain um, if a person uh, living in a remote area in a Sri Lanka with a person with a disability, if he or she want to join a para sport, what is the path there? What are the available uh, options? Now, uh, very recently we developed a program in partnership with the Department of Social Services. So the closest person to reach is the Grama Niladari for a person with a disability and then to meet the relevant social service officer attached to the closest AG division. Mm -hmm. And uh, the SSO or the social service officer will make recommendations to the district social service officer to uh, get the person with a disability, he or she, uh, to get involved in uh, the closest sports event in the district, and thereby to introduce the athlete to the National Paralympic Committee. This is, this is uh, what we developed develop very recently in March. On 24th of March, we had a seminar for the first time between the National Paralympic Committee and the Department of Social Services uh, for all 25 district sports officers. And there we outlined the uh, talent identification program as to how we could get uh, eligible persons to do uh, sports uh, that will be in uh, three ways, like either for recreational purposes, and then non-competitive reasons, and then uh, the best performers during the district meet will be sent to compete at the national para-athletic championships at the highest level. So that will be the competitive 
liver. So this is what we have uh, developed very recently, although we had this concept uh, uh, way back from 2014, which did not materialize under different uh, ministry officials, ministers, ex-presidents uh, of the para movement and so on. So this is what we developed very recently and then uh, we hope for the best. So uh, we uh, hope that at least uh, double the amount that we saw during our recently conducted organized uh, athletic meet uh, would uh, take part in the next year's annual athletic meet uh, from grassroots level. So that, that, that is my answer. Okay, thank you, Priyanta. If there are any questions, you can ask now. So uh, we came to at the end of this uh, end of the session now, and uh, I would like to hand over the floor to uh, Dr. Saraji uh, to start the next session. Thank you, thank you for all speakers. And thank you, uh, Prasanna. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Samita. Thank you, uh, so next, uh, yeah, on to the last symposium of the day. I would like to invite Dr. Padma Gunaratna uh, and Dr. Nandana Velake to chair the session. Uh, it's on end, end of life care and uh, coping with disabilities. Over to you, madam. Um, thank you, Sarachi. Thank you very much. Uh, we are moving on to yet another important symposium. It would be on care in the elderly and coping up with disabilities. This will be chaired by myself and uh, Dr. Nandana Velagi, um, lecturer in occupational therapy. Uh, we are supposed to have three speakers, but uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that uh, um, our second speaker is unable to attend uh, due to an unavoidable reason. Uh, uh, and uh, it was at a, so much of a short notice that we got the information so that it was not possible for us to find a replacement. Uh, so we would be having two speeches. Our first speaker is occupational therapy management in dementia uh, uh, that will be done by Mrs. Nadisha Priyangani Manathunga, the occupational therapist from National Institute of Mental Health. So let me invite Dr. Nadisha Priyangani Manathunga to make a presentation on occupational therapy management in dementia. Over to you, Nadisha. I think you all have here now. Thank you, Madam, for giving this opportunity. Okay, I will share my screen.
sorry for the delay. Uh, I think you all have shown my screen here. Okay, today I will uh, do, sorry, today I will do the occupational health management for dementia. So, right, today uh, the topic is occupational health management for dementia. Uh, I will explain a little bit about dementia, what is dementia. Uh, dementia is an acquired global and usually chronic or progressive disorder characterized by generalized psychological dysfunctions of higher common conditions after age of 65. Or uh, It's an organic disorder. Uh, now uh, the 50 million people live with dementia worldwide and expected to be tripled in 2050. The, I mentioned here the few clinical features. The present in complaints of poor memory, normally recent memory is affected, long-term memory is remaining, progressive impairments in intellectual functions and personality, and apathy, uh, behavioral disturbances, impaired or variation of emotional uh, control, difficulty in uh, new learning and language, uh, difficulty to complete in normal tasks, uh, confusion, the struggling to adapt to change, being repetitive, failing sense, and the hallucination. So uh, the occupational therapy management can be uh, described, can be uh, explained under uh, four approaches, health promotion, remediation, uh, maintenance, and modification. So first I uh, explain health promotion uh, briefly. Uh, in here, focus maintain strength of the client, promoting wellness of the care providers and uh, can enrich their lives by promoting maximal performance in uh, preferred activities. Uh, in, the, as a, in here, we will do the uh, health promotional awareness session, uh, orientation programs, relaxation programs, uh, religious activities, fall prevention techniques, these things we will do under this health promotion. The second one is remediation. Uh, the remediations of cognitive skill is not expected, can incorporate uh, routine exercises into their interventions to uh, improve the performance of activities of daily living and the functional mobility and the, to help restore range of motions and uh, strength and endurance. Third one is maintenance. Can, uh, uh, we can provide support for the habits and routines that are working with persons uh, with dementia can be maintained to prolong independence. Uh, in here, we will do the cognitive stimulation activities, sensory integration activities, reminiscence therapy, and also the ADL training. Fourth one is modifications. The most frequently used intervention for those dementia ensure safe and supportive environment. We will use the adaptations and compensations, including verbal cue and personal assistance and also the social support. The stage of dementia also very important when we are discussing about occupational therapy management for the dementia because the occupational therapy interventions for the people with dementia will vary based on the stage of their diagnosis. Uh, someone in the uh, early stage of dementia uh, will vary different intervention than someone with severe dementia. So the types of dementia, after doing series of uh, occupational therapy dementia assessment, uh, we will uh, do the goal settings and come up with a personalized plan to help to regain independence in everyday life. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. Uh,
Right. I will explain what are the assessment normally we are used. Uh, uh, there are several uh, uh, areas we will assess using these assessment, cognitive functions, uh, functional areas. Uh, we will check by using these assessments and aggressive behaviors, depression, caregiver burden and risk of fall or barriers of the environment. We will use these uh, assessment. And uh, after assessing, we will set the goal. Um, before starting rehabilitation program, uh, collaborate with the patients and family. We will set the long-term and short-term goals. Uh, I will mention here some example. Uh, long-term goal is he will be able to manage his medication independently within one month. Uh, for that, uh, we can set the short-term goals as uh, he will be able to aware about conditions and its management within one week. He will be able to take the correct medication dosage using a pre-packed medication dosage box and an alarm within two weeks. He will be able to take medications independently under caregiver observations within one week. These are the short-term goals. Uh, but the, we are focused on one or two goals rather than trying to address everything at once. Uh, in early stage of dementia, uh, the clients will be able to function at uh, work and in their normal activities, uh, simply uh, notice uh, misplacing keys, forgetting to keep, take medications, missing another appointments like that. In here, occupational therapists will uh, incorporate with memory aids like uh, reminders, calendars, checklists, alarms, and accurate routines. Caretakers also will be involved one-to-one. -one. Everyone is on the same page about on these goal settings. In middle stage, uh, memory might start to decline even further. So have more trouble with basic self-care activities, making it uh, to the toilet on the time, brushing their teeth. In here, as occupational therapist, uh, focusing on the caretakers by educating on what to do and help to retrain, to get dressed, to tie shoes, to have a shower and eat. In late stage, uh, disease has entirely taken hold of the patient's sense of uh, space and time, almost totally depend on caretakers. Uh, the occupational therapist focuses less on the patient and mostly on those caretakers. In here, occupational therapist uh, educating the caretakers on how to safely transfer the patient, uh, home exercises program to do with the patients, other techniques to improve the patient's way of life and the support in for caretakers to manage their stress also. Uh, in here, the occupational therapist intervention for cognitive impairments. Uh, we will use cognitive stimulation activities, cognitive training or cognitive remediation activities and also the cognitive rehabilitation activities. Uh, cognitive stimulation activities uh, in here, lack of stimulation and boredom are the most frustrating things. So important to provide activities that engage and bring pleasure that keep them in high spirits and prevent them from developing depression, violation, anxiety and irritability. So aims are the style memories and allow them to reminisce about their life, foster emotional connections with others, encourage self-expressions, make them feel more engaged with life and also the help them feel productive. These are the uh, some examples for cognitive stimulation activities, the exercise and physical uh, mobility reminiscence uh, about their life because the uh, recent memory affected in dementia, but uh, uh, long-term memory is remaining. So we will use uh, long-term memory uh, for this reminiscence therapy. Uh, for that, uh, we will uh, use some uh, aids like uh, memory box, memory box, um, some uh, family trees, uh, photo albums like that, and engage them in their favorite activities. Uh, always we have to uh, check their favorations for the activities. Uh, it as a stimulation. 
cooking and banking, animal therapy, go out uh, and about, explore nature, read their favorite books, engage them in their favorite topics, music therapy, arts and craft, simple and fun activities like that. I will mention some photographs here. Like, uh, cognitive training or cognitive remediation activities is a behavioral treatment. Uh, it is used for who are experiencing cognitive impairments that interfere with daily functioning. Successful cognitive functions are vital for engaging with task, environment and healthy relationships. Cognitive remediation therapy influenced by errorless learning, shaping and positive feedback, uh, prompting, modeling, generalizing and reading. Uh, these are some examples for cognitive remediation uh, exercises. Like uh, these are some uh, board games, some uh, 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 online apps. We will guide them to play how to play it. What are the uh, what are the important uh, of it like that. These are the pictures of. Cognitive rehabilitation is the third one. Cognitive rehabilitation is a systematic, functionally oriented service of therapeutic cognitive activities based on assessment and understanding of the person's brain behavior deficits. Services are directed to achieve functional changes by uh, the reinforcing, strengthening, or re-establishing previously learned patterns of behavior or establishing new patterns of cognitive activity or compensatory mechanism uh, for impaired neurological system. These are some examples for cognitive rehabilitation activities. Uh, face name recall, we can guide them to uh, achieve these. Association strategy. Mm, story recall, we can use these uh, techniques for story recalls, WH questions, what, where, who, when, uh, why, and PQRST strategy also we can use to guide them. Uh, and also organizational techniques, uh, verbal visual schematic, uh, visual scanning, visual scanning training for the reading. These are some examples visual peg methods, uh, method of flow, uh, these, uh, these are for the uh, improving attention. There are four types of attention, sustained attention, selective and alternating, uh, and divided attention. For these activities, uh, we will use for the improve these types of attention. Uh, environmental adaptations also uh, can be categorized under the uh, cognitive rehabilitation, especially memory aids. I will mention some memory aids here. The large clock, large number of calendar, diary, to-do list, and also the reminders. The intervention for BPSD management of dementia. The, in here, it's extend from sensory stimulation to cognitive and behavioral approaches. As sensory stimulation, we will use music therapy, dancing therapy, uh, the, and uh, cognitive and emotional oriented things we will use as the reminiscence therapy, short-term group therapies, and also the structured uh, routine care. Other examples are art therapy, relaxation exercises, yoga programs, meditations, uh, participation for religious activities, music sessions. Uh, these are also the cognitive rehabilitation activities. I will mention some uh, photographs here. And intervention for activities of daily living. Uh, activities of daily living uh, categorized into two basic, basic activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. The basic activities of daily living like eating, grooming, bathing, dressing, toileting are affected in moderate to severe stages of dementia. 
and the uh, instrumental activities of daily living like uh, cooking meals, doing household chores, shopping, handling finances. These things are affected in uh, mild cognitive impairment and early stage of dementia. And then uh, the cognitive decline and the behavioral symptoms are together tends to the impairments in functional abilities. Uh, as occupational therapist, we will use these things for uh, getting their functional independency. Uh, the task simplification, ta activity grading, backward chaining, errorless learning, environmental adjustment, assistive devices, adaptive devices, and also the caregiver education is the very uh, important things. I will mention here the some signs of the under the environmental adaptations. Um, these are also some environmental adaptations. We, uh, instead of the slippery mats, we will we can use these kind of uh, mats and the uh, door locking systems, alarm systems, also uh, suitable for the uh, persons who have wandering behaviors. And uh, this kind of uh, lightning system, proper lightning system, also very best for the dementia patients. And uh, highlighted lines then staircases instead of the steps we can use the uh, ramps and also uh, in here i mentioned the modified bathroom and the adaptive devices here and we can use some splints also for getting uh, their uh, functional independency and the walking aids so uh, dementia patients normally uh, have the falling risk. So we will assess their falling risk and environmental barriers and uh, they, I will, we will uh, introduce some environmental adaptations, adaptive devices and things. Uh, for falls prevention, so we will uh, give some walking aids by getting proper measurements and uh, interventions for caregiver burden. The, this is also very important in uh, dementia management. The, the signs of uh, them, the feelings overwhelmed or constantly worried though, and the feelings tired often and getting too much sleep or not enough sleep, gaining or loss in weight, uh, becoming easily irritated or angry, loss in interest in activities used to enjoy, the feeling sad, having frequent headaches, bodily pain, or other physical problems, and also abusing alcohol or drug, including prescription medication. So if they don't take care of themselves, they won't be able to care for anyone else. That's why it's really important. Uh, in here, the, we, as an occupational therapist, we will uh, do the caregiver education about illness, progression and its management, uh, to accept help and uh, to focus on what they are able to provide, to set the realistic goals, to set personal uh, health goals, uh, to introduce good coping strategies, and also the help to get connected and then the get them to caregiver supportive groups, uh, arrange caregiver patient group, arrange an activity day. Uh, activity day mean we will arrange some uh, the session uh, by getting uh, both uh, clients and caregivers. So under our supervisions, we will ask them to engage how to cope with that kind of patients. And we will give some activities and uh, observe how, how they engage, how they talk to the patient. That's why. So uh, we will arrange an activity day and uh, help to seek social support and guide them to meet a doctor. Thank you. Thank you for giving this opportunity. My presentation is over. Um, thank you, Nadisha. And if you have any questions, you can ask uh, at the end of this session. So let me, uh, with the absence of the second speaker, let me introduce 
the third and the final speaker of this session, uh, Dr. Udyangani Ramadasa, consultant physician attached to University of Sabaragamu. Her topic is end of life care. So over to you, Dr. Ramadasa. Good evening. Thank you, Chairperson, Sir, and Madam. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Fatma Gunaratna for inviting me to talk about end of life care in this uh, uh, forum. So, uh, yeah. So, when we talk about end of life care, first of all, we would like to know the difference between the palliative care, end of life care, and terminal care. So, uh, so if a patient is diagnosed to have a life-threatening illness, life-limiting illness, uh, that patient would need palliative care. So it would be months, days, so even several years. And if you think that the patient has only one year or less to live, that is the period of end of life. So last one year of life. And if you find the patient is actively dying, irreversible period of decline of life, last days of life is called as the terminal phase. So in patients who are entered the end of life, they will need support uh, in the last month, so the one year of their life. And they will need help to live as well as Can you see the slides? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, sorry, sorry about, about that. that. So, so I, I wanted, wanted to say, I, I want, want to show that, that anyway. anyway. Um, how can I? How can we go to the first sites? So, can you start from the first slide, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, what I wanted to say first is that. Now you have. No, it's not moving. I wanted you all to look at. The palliative care is once the patient is diagnosed to have a life-limiting illness, it may be days, weeks, or even years. 
months and end of life care is the life period of last one year of life it may be weeks to months and the terminal care is the period that uh, terminal phase is the period that the patient is actively entered the dying phase so in during this end of life period the people patients will need support to live uh, as well as possible, as actively as possible, uh, a quality life until they die and to die with dignity. And we need to have a care plan. It should be patient-centered according to the patient's wishes and preferences. And we should not forget about the family, the caregiver, and those who are important to the patient. So it is not just care of the patient, it is the care of the patient as well as the uh, caregivers. So when we want, uh, want to have a care plan, we should know what is the trajectory of the illness or what will happen naturally to these patients. So this is the basic trajectory of all the patients where uh, once their functional level would deteriorate slowly over a longer period of time, and there would be significant decline of function with acute illnesses, sometimes may need hospital admissions. And by once they improve, they will not improve up to the level they were before. And one of these exacerbations, the patients will uh, die. So how are we going to diagnose, identify the end of life period. So the first of all, the first step is we as clinician, we should ask this surprise question. Am I surprised to see this patient? Uh, for example, a patient in 2023, September to live. If you see, if you see that patient living in 2023, September, are you surprised? If that's so, that means the patient has reached the end of life. So then we need to find whether there are any general indicators of declining of life. And then we need to find out whether there are specific clinical indicators, such as depending on the underlying comorbidity, heart failure, liver failure, renal failure, or even old age, frailty, dementia, so whether there are any specific indicators. So what are the indicators of decline, general indicators? The disease activity, as the previous speaker said, we need to find out the functional performance status of the patient. And what is happening with the comorbidities? Whether, uh, whether that would has uh, has a um, significant impact on the mortality and morbidity in this patient, and whether this patient would need increasingly support even for activities of daily living and self-care. And what is happening about the underlying comorbidities, whether the patient is unstable, deteriorating complex symptom burden, so then we know that these are the general indicators of declining. And we need to find out whether these patients are resistant to treatment, whether the diseases, underlying diseases are irreversible. And whether there is one stage the physician might say, I have no further active treatment that I can offer to this patient. And progressive significant weight loss, repeated unplanned hospital admissions, and sentimental events such as falls, low serum albumin. So those are the general indications that our patient is declining. And you have to do objective functional assessment. So the Bartle index, kind of the performance status, uh, eco performance status with those things that you can actually find out. Uh, whether this patient has definite functional declining. And then we have to find out 
the, whether they are having specific indicators. So I will concentrate only about frailty here, but there are specific indicators for each and every disease, neurological diseases, cardiovascular and respiratory and nef neurology and nephrology. So the individual patient who present with multiple comorbidities, significant impact on day-to-day -day living and deteriorating functional score, as I mentioned before, and combination of at least three of the following symptoms, weakness, slow walking speed, significant weight loss, exhaustion, low physical activity, and depression. So once we identify the patient has entered the end of life, we need to start discussions. Why? What, is, what are our aims? We need to explain the patient as well as the caregivers and relatives that he might live last only few months. And we need to review current treatment based on the patient's goals. And we have to agree upon with the patient as well as the uh, caregivers and the physician should agree and set up goals for further treatment, focusing on intervention to support living well, to improve the quality of re remaining life, and intervention that are no longer helpful, sometimes the intervention that might uh, futile and increase further burden to the patient. So all these discussions, treatment plan has to be documented and communicated with the colleague as part of the routine handover. In when we pay, refer these patients to local hospitals, or even to other colleagues, we need to document all these things and we need to uh, discuss uh, those things which have identified and it is very important to the patient. And how are we going to provide end of life care? It is very important to educate the skills of those caring these patients at home. So we need to educate the carer and caregivers at home, how are we going to look after this patient during this period? Not only the caregivers, even the, uh, even the healthcare professionals has to have a very good knowledge and skills as well as attitudes uh, regarding uh, managing these patients. So it should be a holistic assessment. It's, it is not just the physical, physical problems that we concentrate on, social, psychological, spiritual as well. And we need to find out the distressing symptoms. It may be physical, such as pain, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting, constipation, as well as physical, psychological, and social. And it's very important to develop the communication skills uh, uh, the caregivers, uh, care, I mean, healthcare professionals. And we need to prepare these patients for death. They have to uh, see, they have to be prepared for a good death. Not only the patient, even the caregivers and family members, their loved ones. And we need to concentrate on spiritual care. It may be, unless we specifically ask these questions, they would suffer, they will think about life without, they might suffer and they might be having fears and all, but those, those will not be addressed unless we specifically look for. So what are the important elements in end of life care planning? Open communication, because it's the life of the patient. The patient has to complete the life to leave this world. So uh, it's very important to openly communicate about the symptom control, treatment decisions, and place of ongoing care or even death. And we need to honestly prognosticate. Uh, we need to prognosticate and we have to have honest discussion with the patient and family members. We all know if the patient has an end-stage cancer, we can prognosticate quite well, but the patients who, who don't have, uh, who has underlying uh, non-cancer uh, diseases, there are always, we are uncertain whether this patient, there are incidences that a uh, patient might suddenly die as well as might recover unexpectedly. So um, it's important to uh, uh, discuss these things. 
and the symptom control. As I said, it's not just the pain that we concentrate on. They suffer due to nausea, vomiting, anorexia, constipation, delirium, dysphagia, whole lot of uh, incontinence, anxiety. And as I said, the physical needs, as well as the psychological distress, anxiety, suffering of family or caregivers, spiritual needs and end of life questions, depression, bereavement support, so it is a holistic care and we need to address all these things. This is a quoting uh, I got, uh, Francis Bacon has quoted, men fear death as children fear the dark. And as that natural fear is in increasing, uh, in children is increased with their so is the other. So we need to prepare them. We have to support them to uh, face this uh, unpleasant or uh, they have to face this situation. So the care at terminal phase is very important. It is important not only to the patient, especially for the family members, because the family members, how they weave the manner of death of their loved ones will have a major effect on their bereavement. And it will echo down the years in the way they look at the healthcare as well as the process of this death. And we should be skillful, we should be skilled enough to diagnose dying. That is something which is very lacking in our healthcare system. We try all sort of unnecessary, futile interventions without addressing the problem. So it is complex, it's true, Some, but it is a challenge, it's true, but we have to develop those skills. So we need to diagnose dying. So how are we going? What are the things that we have to address? We have to look into the performance status of the patient, disease trajectories, and the symptom burden. So there are four types of indicators which have found out. One is sociological, when the patient withdraws from social interactions, and distances himself or herself, they don't talk much. They don't associate with others much. They become isolated and uh, socially withdrawn. Psychic, when the individual accepts the death is imminent and the retreats into himself. We don't openly talk about these things, but we don't know they have already accepted. They know that they are dying, but they have a lot of things to express, but no one talk about it. Uh, psychic and biologic, resulting in reduced level of consciousness and the psychologic, when uh, physiologic, when the vital organs, lungs, brain, heart, and other major systems no longer operate effectively. So, the basically uh, signs of deterioration would be decreasing from performance status and function, increase with trust and frailty, increase in needs for support with activities of daily living, increase in unstable symptom burden, decrease in re response to therapies, decrease in reversibility, specific deterioration associated with whatever the underlying illness, comorbidities of the particular patient. So then we all talk about good death. So what is this good death? There is no right or wrong way to die. We all have to die one day, but we all expect a nice birth as well as a good death and beautiful life. So studies have found out there are six major components in good death, pain and symptom management, clear decision-making, regarding the care, management, uh, medications, as well as their life, life values and life events. Preparation for death. We need to prepare the patient uh, for the death as well as the family to minimize the bereavement and completion of life. We all want to complete life. So if we want to go abroad, we want to settle the things at home before we leave. If you want, if a mother wants to go for work in the morning, leaving their little ones at home, right? So they want to do things before they leave. So we all want to complete things before we go. So completion of life, contributing to others. They may be having a lot of things that they want to 
tell and contribute and give to others. Affirmation of a whole person. It is not just a dead boy. It is just not an organ or any uh, thing. So it is a whole person who is going. So even though the patient is in end of life phase, they still have volition, cognition, giving and receiving love. So they are, they are, uh, they are people who has all these things. So it is defined, would they pass free from avoidable distress and suffering for patients, families, and caregivers, and reasonable, consistent with clinical, cultural, and ethical standard. So the good bit is cultural thing, as well as, uh, as, well as it's depend on the people's, uh, people's beliefs and values. Uh, so how are we going to provide emotional comfort? during this period. Keep them company, talk to your loved ones, read them, watch moving together, movies together and simply sit and hold their hand. So be with the patient, talk to the patient, read the patient, keep them company. Don't burden the patient asking unnecessary questions. Don't burden the patient asking uh, unnecessary questions, but as well as, Try to uh, try to cope, uh, try to help uh, to reduce the fear of uh, fear fear of death, dying, and we need to help them to cope with sadness and loss. They are going to lose a lot of things, not only the social contacts, loved ones, and the financial and other stuff. They are going to lose their whole life. So. And uh, allow your loved ones to express their fear of death. So unless we talk to them, unless we uh, open up their uh, their worries, so uh, we they will not uh, come out with. The usual happening in Sri Lankan setting is that the diagnosis is not delivered to the patient. So and one study has done by Dr. Pereira, ENT surgeon uh, with cancer patient, whether to tell or not. The diagnosis. You won't believe uh, more than 94% of Sri Lankan people actually wanted to know the diagnosis. So if you actually, there are, there are incidences that some patients, they don't want to know anything. So they are very poor. So you need to explore and find out whether they really uh, would want to. So otherwise, you will never be able to explore, open up these things, allow them to reminisce, talk about their life, and past, uh, past experiences uh, and avoid withholding difficult information as I explained before. Honor their wishes, reassure the patient that you will honor their wishes, such as advanced directives, leaving wills, even though they are not uh, legalized in Sri Lanka setting, but we, we, we can find out what are their wishes and we can actually work towards that. Uh, and respect the patient's needs for privacy. So, uh, so that is something again uh, that uh, we have to think about. So terminal phase, actively dying phase, typically lasts for uh, hours or days, and sometimes very rarely some patients live a uh, couple of weeks. Some patients die gently, but some patients will have a lot of suffering during the last few days of life. So reassure the patient that it is okay to die. You won't believe the other developed countries. Sometimes they don't, the, we should give permission for them to go, otherwise they don't go. So that is why allow them to give them permission, allow them to complete their life, then they will go. Uh, so decisions about hydration, bathing support, and other interventions, very important. So though we understand that this intervention at terminal phase is futile, but the, the relatives the, do not look at in that manner because they think at the prolonging of even one hour of life would be something that you are giving to the patient but they don't realize that it is another prolongation of agony. So we need to discuss these patients because they really love their loved ones. So, and we have to allow uh, them to uh, say things like, please, thank you, I love you, forgive me, so, and to say goodbye. Uh, 
my this my talk will not complete if I don't touch the ethical and legal aspects. So the medical decisions, healthcare, power of attorney, healthcare wishes, living wills. So all these actually depend on the capacity. When we talk about the elderly patients, we can uh, discuss these things if the patient has mental capacity. So otherwise we have to discuss with the family members to find out what they would have been uh, wishes, their wishes would have been, and uh, you can make decisions and dealing with spiritual issues. The people generally think that the spirituality is the religion, religious belief. So no, by the time they enter this end of life, they start to rethink about life. What is life? What is death? What will happen to after that? Uh, whether what I was believing was correct. Why this happened to me, not only to me, and they might be having fears. So we need to address these issues. And then the respect, the dignity. Right. So we think that the dignity is just changing the catheter in a closed environment. No, dignity is that we need to maintain the, their dignity or respect uh, throughout their life until they die. So they will have some idea of my life, I should be like this. I am a person like this. So if you can maintain that, until their time, that is what we, uh, we call as dignity. So we need to respect them, respect for others. We respect their autonomy. We need to empower them to improve their self-esteem, self-worth, and we need to communicate and explore uh, and find out uh, what they really want. And we can't forget the caregivers. So there are, it's part and parcel of the family and the patient. So what they need, they don't need much sophisticated thing, practical care and assistance, comfort and dignity of their loved ones, respite care sometimes when they are so tired and grave support. So bereavement as, is an integral part of palliative care. So grieving after loss is a normal process. Whatever we lose, Whatever we liked, if we lose, we, we will feel some kind of grief. If we lose, as we, this is a, this is a rehabilitation um, workshop, uh, if we lose the independence, that is again a grief. So that is why all these discussions were there by that psychiatrist. So, and so we can't say that this patient should recover 100% after six weeks or two months or whatsoever. So the loss is there. What we need is that the patient to accept that and integrate grief rather than getting over or moving on. We can't say, no, no, nothing happened. No, we, I can forget about my loved ones. No, we have to accept it. We have to integrate it to our life and we have to come back to our normal day-to-day -day, uh, life. So... I would like to say that for further information, you can go to the website of Sri Lanka Medical Association, Palliative and End of Life Task Force, and there are publications. So uh, Palliative Care Manual for Healthcare Professionals in Sri Lanka, which will give a very good uh, account on how are we going to look after these patients. Uh, and then the practice guideline in end of life care. So you can, uh, the old, both PDF copies are there in the Sri Lanka SLMA website. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Udayangani. Now it's the session is open for questions. I'm very thankful to Dr. Udayangani for. Uh, making one of the most difficult topics so simple and uh, for uh, it uh, so easy to understand for all levels of uh, uh, healthcare professionals. Um, I just was wondering that holding hands and COVID dates and how the uh, patients and the caregivers would have felt uh, during the uh, uh, COVID crisis and even now we see COVID patients so I just had a feeling towards those patients. I just want to know that 
what your opinion with regard to care when we give care for COVID patients? Yeah, yeah, that's the problem, madam. Actually, with this COVID pandemic, this was discussing all over the world. So they die without their loved ones around. So, and that was pathetic. And uh, they were sometimes on machines because it is acute thing. And uh, even though during the dying phase, uh, even though the patient has entered the irreversible phase, uh, still there would be active treatment. And uh, so in other countries, what they actually did was uh, with this sophisticated the new information, new technology, actually they were linked with the uh, with the, their loved ones via these uh, these uh, technology and uh, IT facilities like what we are doing now. But uh, but the holding hand and being the patient with uh, uh, with their loved ones will never be able to replace. Uh, with this um, online or that kind of uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this thing. So because of that, we all know now how this COVID would uh, um, transmit and we know everything now, uh, how this virus behaves. So we can we as healthcare professionals that we deal with these patients, we uh, we care these patients. So why can't we allow at least one or two family members or few family members to be with the patient during this uh, last time of their life? So that is something actually, Madam, if you can, uh, uh, now you are one of the uh, uh, leading member in the SLMA uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, as, well, as well as in several um, professional bodies. Uh, so this is something that we have to uh, deal with. Uh, uh, we have to sub, uh, we have to provide uh, these patients who die with COVID, not only COVID, any other infectious diseases, uh, these patients will be, I mean, we, you, we just for a few seconds, you just think that you are having a deadly disease, suddenly this disease appeared and you infected with the deadly virus and uh, now you have to die. You will never be able to complete life. You will never be able to say goodbye. You will never be able to say for, forgive me or thank you. And you will never be able to set up the things, their, uh, their financial and other things, uh, conflicts or whatsoever. So the component of good death will never be able to achieve. So that is something as a professional association and professional bodies, uh, we need to uh, implement in the future in this uh, healthcare system. Uh, thank you, I, mean, I just was thinking another aspect of uh, the same, I think that would not go together. So for instance, when a patient with COVID comes, if it's an elderly patient, a uh, person who needs a caregiver, more often I see that the nurses and the hospital staff is so interested in keeping a relative of the patient the person who brought the patient was kept by the side of the patient because that he is already uh, has he has already been exposed to the patient. Uh, I know several of patients that even in hospitals when a patient is brought by relatives, the same relative who was asked to stay with the patient and in contradiction to what we are doing there. And when patient gets into ICUs, uh, uh, I mean, we generally do not uh, let the relatives to get closer to the patient. So I think that uh, uh, there is so much in uh, uh, what you have said, and that needs uh, further discussion among the uh, health profession. Thank you so much for your uh, very informative presentation. Two okay. questions. Uh, there are questions. Are there any in the flight centers? Are there any end of life care centers in Sri Lanka? Uh, I mean, there are no end of life care. You, you, you now.
first of all, we need to understand the end of life period. We, uh, we say it's basically uh, nearly last one year of life. So the gradual decline, and we understand that the patients, uh, whatever the deadly disease that patient is having, uh, now has come to last months of life. So there are no centers as such. There are palliative care hospices uh, close to the Maharagama, as well as few areas in, in the country. Basically, they are for the cancer patients. And what, uh, as palliative care uh, a person who is mainly involved in development of palliative care in Sri Lanka, what we want is not the centers, right? So this is a very precious period of your life. You are, this is the only period that you can be with your loved ones. And this is the most precious period of the patient who, who are in the end of life. So those patients, rather than institutionalized, unless there are very difficult symptom control that the physician or somebody has to uh, deal with, the rest of the patients should be uh, there at home. So what we have to do is to improve the services and care uh, in the community to leave them, uh, leave they, these patients to live uh, basically at their home with their loved ones rather than in the hospital so or any other institution so that is what we really need to promote but as i said if there is if there are no carers no caregivers and the patient is living alone or some kind of a situation it's true definitely that there should be care institution to care this patient so those are two things that we have to concentrate on. Rather than developing care institution, and one way we need to de develop care institution, but at the same time, we need to promote the care at home with their loved ones. And if you, I mean, if you go to go on a trip, even with a five-star hotel, once you come back home and have your rice and curry with sambal or something, right? So how do you feel? And then you sleep on your own bed with your own uh, pillow and the, uh, and, the, and the cover. So is there a difference? So when you want to die to end the life, they all prefer to stay at home with their loved one. So that is something that we need to consider, we need to improve. At the same time, we accept that there should be uh, institutions for respite care as well as for the patients who don't have any uh, body to look after. Uh, just another question that now there are, I mean, sort of this is in our culture that as we see that the loved ones are uh, in difficulty and uh, I mean, sort of uh, in distress, we started tearing and start crying. Yeah. So how would we, uh, I mean, how does it affect the our loved one? At the patient. Yes, how does, I mean, if you are the patient, yeah. I mean, I say if I'm the patient, yeah. I just would not yeah. like another crying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That is what I said in, the, in, uh, in my presentation, one place I said, don't burden the patient. Don't burden the patient too much. So they want to say goodbye. They want to. They so you should give them permission to die. If you cry and say, "Don't go, don't go, don't leave us," they will never be able to leave. So one of the psychiatrists, uh, Doctor Professor, um, uh, uh, one of our psychiatrists actually uh, say uh, said one day, "If just." For a moment, think that if you died yesterday, can you die yesterday? But even though it is difficult, if you have two more weeks to die, so what that death would be. So that is why. So we need to give them permission. So in other developed countries, they always give permission. It's okay to go. You, it's okay to leave. We are comfortable. We, we, can, uh, we are safe. So then 
they are they, they, all these parents they have they are like they always think that they are they, they even though their children have grown up and big uh, people i mean in the country or the world but still they think that they can't live uh, so they don't they don't won't be able to make decisions or anything without us so give permission so giving permission saying goodbye uh, and kind of let them to complete their life. All three are very important. Uh, so um, for both of us, on behalf of Dr. Nandana uh, Villagi and myself, let me uh, thank uh, all three speakers, sorry, all two speakers of this uh, uh, a uh, very important symposium, care in the elderly and coping up with the disability. I mean, we know that about 15% of our community is elderly and uh, these are part and parcel of, I mean, sort of life and the skills that has to be there with uh, all healthcare professionals, all grades of healthcare professionals and all uh, healthcare professionals practicing in all specialties. So I think that uh, it's very important that we are familiar and I, this uh, uh, symposium added so much value to our conference. So join with me to thank both these speakers, Dr. Nadisha Priyangani Manathunga and Dr. Udayangani Ramadasa for their excellent presentations and making this symposium a success. Uh, so that brings to an end of today's conference, the day one. And uh, let me thank all of you for being with us from the beginning up to now uh, for this very important. We had three fruitful symposia, neurodevelopment disorders in children, psychology and disability, care in the elderly and coping up with disabilities. Likewise, we will be having another three important symposia on spinal cord injuries, disabilities in special senses, and rheumatology and disability, multidisciplinary care tomorrow. We would be starting again at 4 p.m. and would be completing, finishing it by, sorry, we would be starting at 12 and it would be continued till 4 p.m. So join uh, tomorrow again with us. And because of the uh, uh, hybrid nature of the present, uh, conference, we have not prepared the certificate of participation, but there will be certificates for all resource persons, and those will be delivered uh, on, uh, or by, I mean, online. So those would be cert electronic certificates for participation, uh, sorry, for contribution as resource persons. Uh, so thank you again, uh, and join with us tomorrow. And until then, stay safe. Thank you.